Hello, everyone. Uh, happy Wednesday to you. Uh, welcome to the OzContact uh, remote masterclass series. Uh, my name is Derek LaFleur. I'll be the host and moderator for uh, today's discussion. Uh, I'm also a member of the uh, Victorian OzContact committee. Um, so before we kick it off, uh, on behalf of OzContact, uh, I want to say a thank you to all of our members for continuing to support us. Um, 2020 has proven to be a, an interesting and challenging year for all of us. So we're hoping that you and your loved ones are safe and healthy, and that's physical, mental well-being, emotional. Um, we really hope that all of you are, are doing well. And again, thank you for joining us today. Um, so with the challenges of the pandemic and everything else that we're experiencing this year, it obviously is challenging a number of organizations around how to manage their workplaces. So we're excited with this series. We hope it will provide you a lot of uh, information to help you in your roles. Today's first discussion in our series is around workforce planning, uh, and we look forward to um, going through that with you. A few, uh, a few housekeeping measures before we kick it off. So your audio and video have been disabled um, for the discussion. If you want to submit questions, and by all means, please, we encourage you to submit as many questions as you want uh, throughout the whole session. Um, at the bottom of the, um, in the toolbar for the Zoom um, app, you will see a Q&A button that you can use to submit your questions. And you'll also see a little um, uh, checkbox that you can tick around submitting your questions anonymously if you would prefer to do so. And again, we encourage you to submit lots of questions. Um, we have a number of, um, uh, points throughout the discussion where we will refer to your questions and we really want um, to, to do as much of that as possible. Um, a very um, straightforward agenda. There's two high level discussion points we're looking to go through. Uh, the first one is, of course, with the pandemic and organizations needing to move their workforce remotely. Um, what does that mean from a, for traditional workforce management? So we'll have a bit of a discussion on that. And then the second bit will be around some best practice uh, ways of managing um, through that. And again, we'll be going through your questions uh, along the way. So our uh, panel today um, that will um, talk us through the discussion. Now, uh, apologies on behalf of Tim. He was unable to join us today at the last moment, um, um, but we are definitely uh, in the capable hands of uh, Ankit, who's uh, um, one of our key panelists today. So Ankit, I'll ask you if you can jump uh, jump in and introduce yourself. Thank you, Derek. Um, Ankit Jindal, Workforce Planning Manager at Benigo and Adelaide Bank. Um, I will look after uh, the call center area for the um, bank where, we, where the main customer phone line comes in. Um, I've been in workforce planning for eight plus years now and been through a series of um, you know, uh, organizations uh, in different sectors such as health, retail, um, and health, retail, logistics, um, and now uh, finally in finance. It really is a challenging year, as Derek mentioned, 2020, um, and learned a lot. I think uh, learnings from last seven years plus has really come light in this one year, and I had to put all the experience in. So, right, and thank you, uh, OzContact, for this opportunity and sharing our insights. Thank you, Ankit. Appreciate it. Um, and myself, as the host moderator, I, I previously mentioned I'm a member of the Oz Contact Committee in the Victorian branch. Um, I also have my own consultancy business. I've spent my whole career in contact centers over 25 years. I've done almost any role that you can think of within contact centers. Um, and uh, very early on in my career, um, one of those roles was workforce planning. Um, and so I truly understand the critical importance of this role. It is sort of the brains and the, the nerve center of any contact center. So it made sense for us to start this series with um, this point here. All right. So uh, our first discussion point around the new normal. So um, Ankit, you and I, um, in, in preparing for this um, uh, webinar today, we've had discussions a little bit around, obviously, the journey your organization has gone through of moving from traditional workforce management and contact center operations to remote. So perhaps we can start there if you want to tell us a little bit initially about that journey you've gone through, some of your key learnings, and we'll kick it off that way. Great. Thanks, Derek. 
It's very funny. Uh, same time last year, July, August, um, I was actually talking to Tim until this opportunity again. Um, Derek, when you spoke to me in July and said, oh, um, you and Tim want to present um, on workforce planning. And I'm like, right, what a coincidence. <laughs> you know, um, a year ago, I was on the other side of the fence where I was talking to Tim about the challenges. And I remember sitting in a uh, coffee shop for three hours on a Friday afternoon, just discussing, um, you know, how challenging it would be uh, working from home and how he has implemented IAG. Uh, Tim also offered us to come into the IAG call center uh, take the learnings from there, what the team lead is, what, how does it operationally work? Because thinking, I think what we need to talk about is we need to take that step. Um, and what we are scared of is taking that step. What will happen? We're scared of, uh, scared of that. Personal experience at Benigo and Adelaide Bank, this was probably a one to two year project of moving staff working from home. And, you know, we had to prioritize. We were looking at risks, IT, uh, people plan and strategies. But when COVID hit us on the 11th of March around in Australia, by the 26th of March, 90% um, of our workforce was mobilized. And by the first week of April, uh, we had all our workforce working from home. So I think what it led to for myself or the organization was, no, you just need to take that step and things will pan out. Not that it was a uh, you know, smooth start. Um, the month of April, as we all know, and all, in all financial institutions and everywhere else, it was a rocky road. But we took a lot of learnings. We modified our training material. We did have an induction coming up um, in in middle of April that was planned for. People had been recruited for. And we were like, we have to think differently. How do we do induction differently? How do we have you know our rosters um, aligned differently? It was nothing, nothing changed. Um, what we realized, we probably, when we took the step, after that, we realized it, um, it was it was easy um, and it was not as difficult. Yes, it wasn't that easy. Would you, would you say, Ankit, that that was probably a surprise that um, it seemed that it was BAU, but obviously in a remote setting, but did, did, did you find that, that surprised you a bit? It did, uh, it did. And you know, why it works is that, that's why I said today where I'm sitting along with Tim now and saying, yep, it does work. And, you know, it's so confidently <laughs> that it does work. So it's the, I call it karma at times, uh, you know, it, what it comes around. So, and it came quick around for me in a year rather than, you know, talking about it, I actually had to do it. So I, I overcame those challenges or anyone in the organization came those, overcome those challenges. There was a couple of key learnings that we took um, from, from there on um, is that we, we said to ourselves, we need to take the step. You know, we challenge our status quo and say, let's do it um, because that's important. Until we do it, we won't know about it. Uh, we needed to be consistent about it as well. You know, and, um, we, need, we needed to make sure we we're passing the consistent messages to all our frontline staff so that no one gets confused about it. A lot of centralization of documents uh, and, you know, controlled version of documents were to be rolled out as well, because now everyone's in a remote environment and, you know, you need to reach out to all the audience in the same way. So I think we really um, started centralization of a lot of those documents. One more. All right. It, it sounds fantastic. Maybe we can kick off into the, into, I guess, more um, uh, of your points there into the new normal. So I've just, change the, um, the slide there for you and um, uh, go ahead. Sorry. For Great. Um, I yeah. think uh, with the new normal, um, before we go into the details of it, there's four things that are really important. Um, and we need to have that in the forefront of our mind is trust. Mm -hmm. We need to trust our people. We need to trust our techno, uh, you know, our leaders. We need to trust our systems that, um, you know, that they will work. They will work from home as they are working in your know, office environment because it's not different. Another thing is technology. Yes, the technology will work too. Everyone does have internet connection issues. Everyone does have power outages, but that does happen in the office as well. You know, the outages are uh, something that does happen, but we need to build on technology or adapt to the evolving ev te uh, technology to adapt to it as well in our um, offices. Leaders, I think leaders need to see different modes of communication. What the biggest learning throughout this journey was how do you keep people engaged and how do the leaders keep the people engaged in there? That was the key because the mental health of a lot of our staff really is important. And, you know, in working from home in isolation where people are used to seeing their colleagues making a cup of coffee or going away, 
it's changed. It's very different. So that was the four key things uh, as well we really needed to talk about. Oh, fantastic, Ankit. Now, we've had a question come through um, related, obviously, to, I guess, the new normal. So the question is, how did you train your new uh, or any new recruits um, remotely? Um, can you talk us through a little bit about how you've done that yeah. at the bank? Yeah. So what we did is we did have different systems available. So uh, I'm not sure if everyone uses WebEx or Microsoft Teams, but we put in um, the trainers using Microsoft Teams and um, WebEx and sharing the consultants actually in at their home, sharing their screens. Also, what we did uh, was about with our training uh, was all, all delivered, you know, through the Microsoft Teams or WebEx. We made it more engaging. Um, so it stopped um, in the middle of it, said, hey, how are you going? Play a game with the staff and probably then come back um, to the training material because the feedback that we had was it, it's so intense. It's like a four week training program. It's so intense. So we needed to break it up a bit and make sure they're engaged and you know, they're not sleeping. So I know cameras at that time were a challenge as well to turn on due to the bandwidth and everything else in such a short time. So, uh, but we regularly connected. So, you know, sending out packs to them. Uh, we sent out their, a small game pack for a six week period saying we'll play one game each week or we'll do a different activity. And that really helped uh, the guys themselves. So. Uh, it was really, really good um, seeing that uh, happen. Uh, I'll uh, interrupt you for just a moment, uh, Ankit. We've got uh, Tim who has um, dropped in to join us. Uh, how are Hi, you, Tim? Everyone. I'm great, Derek. So sorry about my technical difficulties this morning. I finally uh, no uh, worked out a way to get in. So uh, despite all of our it testing prior, um, I'm still 15 minutes late. Anyway, hopefully you can all forgive me. Um, and I, um, look, I am really looking forward to this conversation. So, um, yeah, sorry. Glad to be here. No worries. Look, fantastic. So, um, look, maybe um, for those who, who, who don't know you, if you want to take a few moments, Tim, just to tell the group a little bit about yourself, then we can sort of go back to the sure. conversation point that we're at now. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. I'll keep it really brief because obviously I really, the value here is getting into the conversation. So um, my, my primary role at IAG is uh, manager of workplace innovation. So I look at the holistic systems and ways of working across the organization uh, with a particular focus on the call centres because of my background and because of the number of employees in the call centres. Um, so my interest is looking at those systems and ways of working and looking for ways of enabling them so that they are more supportive of employee wellbeing. Um, and in particular, um, you know, the, the benefits of that that flow onto the customer and the organisation. Um, so, yeah, in a snapshot, that's, that's how I um, spend my time. Fantastic. Thanks, Tim. Um, so just as you were coming in, Ankit was answering a question from one of our, uh, um, one of our members around uh, how do you recruit um, remotely? And so Ankit was giving us a little bit of information there about the bank. Can you perhaps highlight quickly in terms of IAG how you manage um, yeah. that process? Yeah. So the, um, the onboarding process has evolved with COVID. So we were very much uh, uh, an onboarding process that was um, so context, first of all, we, are, um, we have been 100% recruiting street to seat, so new hires to work from home for about four years. So um, our call centres have been near 100% work from home for, um, for a long time. Um, and therefore, we were already recruiting to work from home roles, but we were still using our offices as part of our onboarding experience. So our consultants, actually, at one point, we were, we were requiring, requiring them to spend six months in the call center, getting to a point of competence and mastery before we actually then enabled them to work from home. And obviously, with COVID, we've had to scrap that and actually do all of the onboarding uh, remotely. And that has meant that we've had to scramble, but we've actually surprised ourselves. So we were of the belief that we needed to spend, we needed to spend six months with our people face-to-face -face before we could send them home in a way that they still felt connected to the organisation, to their leader, to their purpose and the organisational purpose. What we've found as we've scrambled in response is that actually that's not required. And although I think we will go back to some face-to-face -face learning, there's no way we'll be going back to six months as, um, as, as, as the onboarding process. So um, we've learned a lot in the last, few, in the last, last period um, that, yeah, that's definitely, you know, we can do it remotely. Um, and it's entirely possible with a lot of thought 
a lot of compassion, with a lot of communication, it can be done. Okay, fantastic. Now we've had a new question pop in from um, uh, our uh, one of our members. Um, did you notice any changes in customer behavior after the remote work was um, mobilized? Um, so perhaps because it's a little yeah. bit newer, I guess, for your organization, and Kit, maybe if you can uh, start with that one, and then Tim, if there's anything you want to add afterwards. Right. Uh, thanks, Derek. That, that was the question that I asked um, Tim when I met him a year ago. How does the customer behavior change now? Um, because the customer is also in a role or a job that they do. So you now the customer experience, I, I should say, increased um, or was, uh, you know, the brand and the company that the employee worked for was increased and the confidence of the customer uh, with the bank increased as well because they could see their kids in the background or, or you know hear the kids in the background or they hear the you know dishwasher running or a laundry or you know the cat or the dog so i think that developed the trust that you know you still have a job and i think everyone appreciated at that time to oh i'm thank you that i still have a job because we were hearing about so many industries shut down so i think it only helped to grow the brand value instead of the customer behavior because we didn't change anything. We were there for the right. customer. Do you have I'll anything just, further yeah, um, you'd like I'll to just, add to that? I think um, that's the important point here is what it shifts is the customer's perspective of the interaction. So the customer rings up, most call centers, most interactions you're ringing up because you've got a problem that you're solving, perhaps you're frustrated, perhaps you're angry. Uh, and you're at the organization, not at the call center consultant who answers the call, but at the organization. When the consultant is working from home and the, and the, and the, um, the customer realizes that um, or comes to understand that, then it shifts it from a conversation between the customer and the organization between a customer and that person. It humanizes the conversation and it takes a lot of that heat out. Um, and it becomes a human to human interaction not a human to organization interaction. So I actually think that, yeah, the customer behavior potentially is, is softened as a result of that hum humanity that we're bringing into the, into the experience. Mm, outstanding, thank you. Um, I've got another question here, Tim, that's just um, uh, directed at you. Could Tim elaborate on how they structured the training to be able to train 100% from home and I guess, measures and criteria you'd put in place to understand its success? No, I wish I could answer that. And um, unfortunately, I'm just not close enough to it um, in, the, in, in my role. So um, uh, I can, yeah, I can only talk to the results because I hear about those when I, you know, attend the weekly updates and the success of what's happening. Um, but I don't have the detail. I wish I could answer that. Perhaps if you would email me, I can certainly happy to respond or, or, and find out for you. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, Ankit, is there anything that um, uh, you're across from the training element over at, um, at your bank? I would say we, we didn't change much because, again, we were sharing our screens. That's what, uh, instead of people physically present, uh, you had and you know, looking at a wall where you are presenting a PPT um, or uh, a slide or anything like that, what you did is you were sharing it on your screen. So nothing much changed. All you had to do is probably the screen size and the you know the text sizes or those minor changes that you had to do. And as I said at the start, um, add a few more break points um, to keep people engaged in it and not make it more theoretical. So not much change, as I said it's very important to understand work from home didn't change much in terms of what we currently do. Okay, all right, thank you, uh, Ankit. Um, so with the information we have here on the screen now around the new normal, um, I thought perhaps we can chat a little bit about some of the flexibility that perhaps you've experienced in your centers, um, both from the organization's perspective, but also for those who are working from home. So perhaps a little bit around that. Tim, if you can kick us off there. Yeah, um, so from a workforce planning point of view, there is still the process, and you probably covered this off already. I'm sure, sorry, I'm coming in a little late again. Um, but, you know, we still, you know, right, we still, still do the forecasting, we still do the rostering, we still manage the in real time. Um, but the main difference has been the shift patterns that our people have started to um, requ request um, because they're now working from home. And that has um, 
being both beneficial to them and beneficial to the organisation as we've got more employees doing split shifts, we've got more employees doing kind of more unusual shift patterns. Um, and that is, um, you know, it's kind of been a bit of a dream. We've also seen that we've, um, uh, we've increased our part-time mix um, over the last few years as well. It just is, it's been easier to attract and retain part-timers. Um, when, um, when we, before we all worked from home, I would have described um, call centre work as a job until. A job until I get the job I really want. A job until I finish university. A job until I, um, you know, save up enough money to travel overseas. And that was particularly true with the part-timers um, that we were hiring in the past. But now we work from home, we're getting a lot more people because it's, it becomes a job because, and this is where the flexibility comes in. So it's a job because it fits into my life. A job because it allows me to spend more time with my children. It's a job because it lets me do volunteer work with Meals on Wheels. It's a, it's, the part-time element of the role is about, you know, the flexibility has shifted that. And we've now got this quite sticky group of part-time employees rather than a group of part-time employees that have kind of a history of being high turnover. So for me, that's the kind of the big benefit I think we've seen. Fantastic. Um, so, uh, Ankit, I've got a, a, another question here from a member that will sort of segue a little bit uh, on the back of what Tim has just said. So, the uh, question here is, um, uh, directly in your role as a workforce manager, um, what impact have you noticed on, on shrinkage in your organization, um, both in and out of the office? So, if you could talk a little bit about uh, that, please. I think this is really, really good uh, asking that question because yes, we would expect shrinkage uh, to go up. Initially, um, the bank did offer and was very generous in offering 76 hours of sick leave to everyone um, across the bank um, as a COVID measure and you know to not help people in their financial difficulties. I feel the shrinkage went down. Uh, a lot of people canceled their holidays. Um, and not that was good, but you know the overseas holidays were canceled for the uh, first three months or so, where people couldn't travel. Um, your meetings or huddles uh, that you were in the office for got reduced. You know the amount of coffee breaks that you had uh, being in the office because you were chit chatting uh, reduced because uh, you were probably like, "I'll be more on the phone." And the very important one, I think, is the sick leave uh, or the carer's leave um, that the call center, I think, faces the most improved compared to it deteriorating. Um, the improv improvisation was because the leaders showed trust. It's okay if your kid cries. It's okay if you take an extra personal break uh, because you you have to put your kid to sleep or you know you've got um, you've got something else to do. Um, Prior to this, we might have had to take a full day off for a doctor's appointment, but the doctor's appointment changed into telehealth appointments. And they were like, yep, I'll be a quick one hour, um, you know, do um, or probably quick 15 minutes and I'll jump back on. So it just showed the commitment from a different um, angle and, you know, the shrinkage we I expected when it all hit in March that, oh, it'll go through the roof, but it went the other way. And I was surprised by that. And as um, the you know, other states of Queensland and South Australia have opened and people are now about to go out um, and so on and so forth. The shrinkage has increased. So when people are at, were at home or working for, from home and things like that, it was, it was decreasing. Um, so it was a real, uh, real benefit uh, for us. And as uh, Tim said, definitely uh, the flexibility um, that we offered as well really helped. Fantastic, Anke, thank you. Um, uh, Tim, I recall in our lead up to the um, webinar today and our discussions and yes. so on, you had mentioned hearing about new shrinkage um, yeah. categories and so yeah. on. So if you could perhaps uh, talk so, a little uh, bit about that. Yeah, I should. Um, so shrinking experience in this two minute snapshot is technical shrinkage, technical outage shrinkage went up. Um, there's more points of failure in a work from home setup than there is in the office, home internet, other things. So that went up, sick leave went down, other shrinkage kind of went down offsetting and actually creating a net positive benefit for our work from home programs. And that's been the case across the board for the last several years. But recently we've started to see an increase in sick leave and it's, it's, and it's mental health related challenges that employees are facing because of having been working from home for such a long period of time um, in a way without getting that face-to-face -face support. So we run a tethered model. So we run a model where our employees can come into the office and they're tethered to an office, even though they're working from home and they're coming in for a fortnightly um, team meeting 
Um, they come in for, and in that time, they might have one-on-one -on -one coaching. There's an opportunity to have face-to-face -face interventions with our people, whether it's to support their performance or their well-being. That's obviously not been available for the last six months. As a result, we're starting to see an increase in mental health-related um, shrinkage. And interestingly, I was talking to some other organisations around this because they're definitely not, not the only ones who are experiencing this, is that some businesses and some very big organisations are starting to look at potentially adding in additional wellbeing breaks into the day in order to help address this. So um, I think, yeah, there's definitely an opportunity, I think, for us to, um, without that safety net of having the tethered face-to-face -face relationship, um, I think that there perhaps is additional shrinkage needed um, at this point in time. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, so um, I'll move us along to the second of the major discussion points around um, what we've just called there the, the next normal. Um, and I'd like to start uh, in this section here with you, Tim. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you've been a passionate supporter of working from home yeah. and remote working uh, structures for a very long time. So this must be absolutely fantastic for you to see, albeit yeah. some of it being driven by a pandemic. But if you can talk a little bit about how you've seen this journey and leading us into this next part of the discussion. Yeah, I think um, so definitely we've, we've definitely seen an acceleration of the acceptance of work from home because organisations that had resistance have been forced to, to into that, um, forced to implement work from home. And as a result, they've actually discovered the big secret, which is that actually call centres are one of the best suited workforces for work from home. So it's like the secret's out, which is fantastic. Um, but I think there's some evolution in, and from a next normal, normal perspective that, that we can then start to explore. So work from home, I think, is the new normal. The next normal is from a workforce planning perspective, you're starting to understand how our workforce planning practices impact our people. So in call centres, we are what we measure uh, and we make decisions based on what we measure. We're a very metric driven um, industry and that's perfectly okay. The only downside is that we, um, if, you know, we can measure very accurately the impact of our scheduling practices on the business, on the service level, on our customers, on the cost of, the, cost of run the organisation, the cost of serve. We can, we, we can measure that in our call centre environments with incredible fidelity. But what we can't measure with the same level of fidelity is the impact of those scheduling practices on our people. So we can't measure the impact of a team member not being able to attend a carnival, sporting carnival with their children. We can't measure the impact of a, of a team member being able to pick up their children and drop them off to school every day. We can't measure the impact of a person who being able to take on additional caring responsibilities with their elderly parents or not being able to. So there's a whole heap of human impacts to our people as a result of our scheduling practices that are not measured with anywhere near at all or at, at, at minimum without not in the same level of fidelity as what we can measure the business impacts. And as a result, I think that because we are what we measure in call centers, our measurements drive our behaviors. Without that data, we are some, I think we are starting to understand now through enabling work from home and seeing the benefits of that, that potentially the way we've enabled work in call centres has not been optimal to the well-being of our workforce. And that's a challenging thing to look in the face of. And I think it's actually really important for the organisation, for the industry to take this opportunity, which is the pandemic and the, the, the force shifts that we've needed to make as an industry to um, support the health of our employees and enabling them to work more flexibly and work from home. Now we're starting to see the benefits of that. We need to also flip that around and look at ourselves in the eye and go, well, if that's the benefit of people being able to work from home, what has been the harm caused by the old ways of doing things? And that's actually hard. It's like the shadow side of our work. And we need to do that shadow work and actually look ourselves in the eyes in the industry and understand that understand that we haven't understood it because we haven't been able to measure it because and that's our, been our bias but now we're starting to see it we're starting to feel it we're starting to get the stories back and so now there's this enormous opportunity for us to transform our industry and take the lessons from the pandemic and apply them and start to evolve our practices particularly in scheduling practices to be more supportive uh, and empowering towards our employees 
So that's my kind of passionate rant. I'll stop there. Um, <laughs> but I really do think that there's an enormous opportunity, but we've got to have the courage to look ourselves in the eyes in the, as an industry and acknowledge that our industry, whilst it does amazing things and creates incredibly fun, enjoyable, energetic working environments, at times our scheduling practices have been harmful to our people and their families. And we've just mm. sucked it up and accepted that as an un, unintended wish we could do better. It's just the way things need to be, you know, I wish it could be another way, but you know, it's a business after all, and we just have to do that. We don't, we're learning that there are better ways to do things. Uh, fantastic points, Tim. Um, completely agree with you. Um, uh, and it, uh, it, it obviously, you know, part of what Tim's gone through all the, the different ways that we're measuring contact centers, you know, and, and it, it, um, there's, we're not short of stats and, and, and metrics, that's for sure, in our industry. Um, there's a, a member question here I'd like to, to, to throw your way. Um, for you at the bank, have you had to develop any new tools to measure speed to competency um, with remote learning and, um, you know, uh, helping new agents to achieve baseline performance? How have you been able to um, work through that at the bank? See, we did have KPIs already in place, and the KPIs um, did reflect everyone's performance. Um, um, we at the bank also have a plan of a six-week check-in, a four-and-a-half-month check-in, and a, uh, a six-month check-in before uh, a staff passes probation or reach that probation phase. And we do measure success at each of those points. And what success looks like is pretty much the same, what we measured previously. Because as we have spoken about previously, nothing's changed. So why should we make the people feel that change as well. And if we aren't, if we are seeing some areas of development or some areas that the um, employee needs help in, we really help them to that next level. So, hey, why aren't you, you know, security or, you know, risk, financial risks or anything like that, that comes to us. We really look into it with the staff member and say, yep, uh, yes, we can work towards it. Yes, there is an area. So, Again, not a big shift. As Tim said, it's only helping us to, you know, realize that it was not a big shift and it's more of a people space. And people are trying a bit more harder than they would have when they were in the office because there was a lot of distractions. Um, and I did an exercise at the bank as well, uh, very related to the same, where um, I talked about communication and stood in front of um uh, being in the call center itself, stood in front of a couple of people and waved my ha hands in the air or did a funny dance and they got distracted. And what they were talking to the customer, they got distracted and probably made a mistake. But at home, that goes down and they're more focused and they're saying, yep, I'm in my space. I really want to deliver. So I think the outcome has improved in an overall version. And as we can say, um, Tim's so passionate about talking about that. It's really helped us, um, you know, learn and I was, as I said, I was talking to Tim a year ago. I was on the other side of the fence. Now I'm with him and standing alongside talking about, yeah, we, we, we are the ones who can do it. One thing I think um, that Tim um, also did uh, touch base on is the talent pool uh, that we had has expanded. So, you know, we are not only geographical based, um, you know, hey, I get X talent only in Y place. No, I can get X talent all over Australia now. And it's not that I'm outsourcing it to Philippines or Manila or anywhere else like that. I, I can get the same talent within a wider pool of, you know, regional areas of uh, universities. And we drive as the, as the business, we drive what talent we're looking for. So we can go, okay, we want part-time staff. We should be looking for university students. We'll, while well, Say, for example, if you're in Melbourne, then you look at, um, you know, a specific uh, geographical location and people say, oh, you're in the city. It's really hard for me to get in the city because there's no public transport nearby. So I do have contact, uh, known contact centers in Melbourne as well where, who have developed themselves in the suburbs and near the universities. So most of the industries and most of the call centers are working towards it. But this, this giant leap of the pandemic really changed the approach uh, for every single one of us. Okay, thank you. Um, now I've got a question here from a member, Tim, that I'll direct to you. Um, 
And it's how are you balancing schedule flexibility with meeting business objectives? And I think that can segue nicely into yeah. the final box in our slide there around empowered workforce and, you know, uh, the video that uh, short video that we'll play for the group. So if you can sure. talk a little bit about that question and then I'll play the video that probably uh, links in quite well. Sure. Um, so there is a number, there are a number of tools available to us that can help us with, um, with balancing the flexibility that our people need um, in order to integrate work into their lives. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and those existing tools are things like, um, um, like I've already mentioned, starting to support more, um, you know, varied shift patterns in the way we build schedules, um, potentially introducing shift bidding into the, into the shift, into the roster build phase. Um, and that's, you know, that's, inc that's incredibly empowering and, and um, successfully done that at a couple of different organisations and seen it work very, very well with large numbers of um, employees. Um, and so that can work well. Um, the, the, but we still found that there was a gap and one of the biggest gaps for us and I think in, in, uh, in, in the current solutions on the market is that um, once the roster goes live, which we all kind of provide four weeks out in advance, life happens. And when life happens in that four week window from when the roster is published to event day to yes, that four week period, then, um, then uh, when life happens, it can be very difficult to manage those, cha those roster changes. And um, it often involves a team leader having to get involved. And when we actually started to explore this and have conversations with our people, what we what we heard was that um, the team leaders can spend up to 20%. I couldn't believe it, believe it. And despite all of the, you know, time in motion studies we've done of our team leaders, um, we, we just never saw this, this activity that was happening where the team leaders were negotiating with workforce planning and their managers and other stakeholders on behalf of their people to try and get them the schedule changes that they needed or wanted in order to fit work into their lives. Um, we, was, we saw that shift swaps just was a, was a, a, a broken promise because shift swaps are very hard to find that perfect, perfect companion in order to swap with to get, you know, to, to do that. And if you do, you usually have to ask a favour of a friend and you quickly run out of favours. So shift swapping wasn't working and so there was a big gap. So we've actually had to create our own solution in order to solve that problem. Um, and we've done that by creating an app, which some of you may have heard me talk about before, but it's been incredibly transform transformative for our people. Um, and for our workforce planning team and the real-time managers in particular, um, we actually let our people make changes to their schedules themselves. They don't have to go to their leader. They don't have to go to workforce planning. They don't have to get approval from anyone. They go in there and they make those changes themselves. And that's the critical thing. And this is what I probably mean by empowered workforce, man workforce empowered workforces. I can never fully understand a person and their life and what's happening in their life. Um, and therefore, I'm not in a position... It, to balance that with the needs of the business. Um, I can understand the business needs down to in, in detail, but that person and their life, it's incredibly personal, personal and individual. And so really the only person that is capable of balancing their, their life and their life needs with the needs of the business is actually the person, the, Ross, the frontline employee. They're the only ones that can actually find that balance because um, they're the only ones that have all the information and ever will have all the information if we give them a way of understanding the business needs to the same level of detail that we do as, as managers or as workforce planners. So that's what we've done. We've created a tool that presents the, the business needs um, in a way that they can understand it, their rosters, and they then make changes to their roster in this tool. And, and, it, and what it does is it, it calculates the impact of those roster changes and, and, um, and they can understand that. And so when they move their shifts around, it quite simply, if they make a positive shift change, they earn flex coin. And if they make a negative shift, shift change, it costs them flex coin. Um, and through that flex coin uh, marketplace, um, they are able to make, get what they need. And in return, if it's a negative impact to the business, they give something back. And as a result, we've actually, actually ended up with a net, a roster that goes live on event day is actually has better schedule efficiency than the one that we published four weeks out. Because there's a whole heap of constraints in that roster build. There's EAs, there's awards, there's preferences, there's all sorts of stuff that you have to juggle as workforce planners. There's all sorts of stuff. But our employees actually go in there, they make changes to their schedule, get what they need in order to respond to those life needs, and they end up with a roster that's better for the business. 
it's unbelievable. It's been a credible um, journey. It's taken us nearly five years to get to where we are now because we had to really test and prove and develop the algorithms to get to a place where it worked. Um, but that's, that's the, I, I firmly believe that's the future for all those reasons that the only way we actually reach a point where we end up with systems of work that balance the needs of employees and the needs of the business is actually giving the power to the employee to actually make the decisions because they're the only ones that can ever have all the information to find that balance. All right, fantastic. So uh, I'll play the uh, video to provide a bit more information around in support of um, what Tim has just said. So Thank you, here we go. Call centers, not just at IAG, but everywhere, are possibly one of the most tightly controlled working environments. Some of our team managers were spending up to 20% of their working week trying to facilitate shift changes for their frontline staff. What Switch does is it enables our people to make changes to their roster without having to get manager approval. The app actually presents their roster and the business needs together. Uh, and as they move their schedules around, they can see the impact of those changes on the business performance. What it actually does also is it ca calculates a coin balance. So as, as, if I, as a consultant, move my roster in a direction that helps the business, then I earn FlexCoin. And if I move my roster in a direction that um, is detrimental to the customer, then it costs me a flex coin. And so the consultant gets to balance their changes against their business needs, and they can make any changes they like as long as they've got enough coin in their wallet. And this is something that's never been done before. So this is homegrown, uh, game changing. The way I describe it before Switch yeah, was right. you're limited to your shifts which is normal, that's to be expected in any job that you, you know, you start at a certain time and you finish at a certain time. But with Switch, if life happens, it means you can go to Switch and you can go to that tool and you can just juggle things around. I had the opportunity to use Switch to change a shift um, so I could attend my son's and my daughter's sports carnival. And I just needed a couple of hours in the morning. So I managed to accrue coins from earlier shift swaps and um, I was able to attend the sports carnival and then still do my shift in the afternoon which was fantastic and the kids were so happy to see me there. It makes me feel really proud to work for a company that allows me to make these decisions and be in control of my own time. It makes me feel really valued that they care enough to bring in a tool that makes our work so flexible. It feels awesome, it feels great, I love it. I brag to all my friends about Switch all the time. From my perspective, working at IAG we do have flexibility but with Switch it takes it to a whole new level. The future of flexibility at IAG has unlimited potential, especially with Switch. I've got no doubt that IAG will continue to be ahead of the game because we have a culture of putting our people first and when it comes to our people, we're actually prepared to take some risks. Control, freedom and flexibility. Caring about staff. A user-friendly, beneficial and a privilege. Empowerment, trust and being treated like an adult. I don't have three words to describe Switch, I've only got two. We care. All right, that was uh, fantastic in terms of showing really innovation in action in support of um, um, working from home. Um, before we, um, uh, I guess, move on to the next part of the, the conversation, there's a member question here that uh, I'll just throw out there. I, I suspect I know the answer, but it'll be just an interesting um, discussion point. Um, and the question is around what plans do you have, if any, of bringing people back into the workplace? Um, what is um, the thinking for each of your organizations? Um, and we'll start with you, Ankit. Uh, let's say, you know, uh, a vaccine and, you know, um, we have a brighter future ahead with um, COVID and so on. Um, what are some of the discussions you're, you're, you're having at the bank in regards to the future of working from home? Not, no one's talking about coming into the office. So our Adelaide and uh, Ipswich offices where our majority of the call center is. Um, I'll give you an example. I was talking to a team member of mine in Adelaide. Uh, Adelaide foot traffic per day pre-COVID was about 4,000 people um, into the office. The number uh, last week was 115 the whole day. So, and Adelaide has zero cases, hardly any people in. I think it's just that flexibility um, and what 
Tim's talked about the empowerment to the people, which helps not only with your internal uh, surveys and you know people happiness or you know employee uh, net promoter scores. It also helps your customer net promoter scores or CSATs, uh, customer satisfactions uh, to improve because your people are servicing them better. And we're seeing that graph go up. And if that grows up, I don't think any organization, um, can't talk about the whole of the bank, but any organization as well would be looking to come back to the office and forcing people to come into the office unless there's some uh, significant concerns um, about the staff member or there's a risk that we can't overcome. Uh, Tim, yourself, IAG? Yeah, I can see there's another question here too about um, people, you know, work from home not being for everyone as well. So it kind of relates. So we mm -hmm. were already a work from home contact center operation. We made the transition four years ago to work from home. When we did that, um, we got to about 70 and some businesses, 80% of our workforce transition. So there was still 20 to 30% of people who preferred to work from the office. That's what they, the job they uh, accepted and that's what worked for them. Um, so we still maintain that sort of hybrid model where the office is still available to our people, but the majority choose to work from home. So we actually don't, in, we, we actually create, uh, it's about this concept of empowerment again. It's you get to choose where and we switch when you work. Um, and it's that, and that's the key. And that's what we want to carry forward. What we have though seen, we've just completed a survey of our, um, of all of our staff across the whole organization. Um, but we've seen a significant shift in appetite as a result of COVID because everybody, we had to go to hundred percent work from home because of COVID. Um, and those people that were working in the office, all but 10% are saying that they are now going to, um, uh, so 90% of our people are saying they want to continue to work from home. So we're going to see, uh, well, as a result, we're actually expecting to, um, we'll still have our offices open, um, but there'll be less people wanting to work in the office than, um, than there was previously. So yeah, we're going, with the, we're going down the path of choice, which is consistent with our okay. existing previous model. Tim, yeah. can I? Yeah, yeah go Tim, ahead. Can I, I throw in one? Um, throw in one there. Um, you know, I still remember on your LinkedIn you posted pictures of a Melbourne freeway um, that's always full. Mm -hmm. um, and you know how on the western suburbs where people aren't able to get to the office due to the clog. Um, but what do you think pandemic has done? How do you think that's changed? Um, and are you going to put up a new picture um, on LinkedIn uh, sooner rather than later? <laughs> an empty freeway. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting because the, the, the way in which we design work and we enable work in our community has a lot of unintended consequences that and I've already shared some of those from a contact centre perspective. Um, and one of those unintended consequences is the way in which we have to design our infrastructure as a community, which is a, kind of the point of that. And we continue to kind of address, the, it's like treating the symptom, not the cause. And I'm really hoping that as a result of this COVID experience, the shared COVID experience we've had as a community, that we start to see the opportunities to actually change some of those things that we accepted as sort of non-negotiable. It was non-negotiable that we had to go to work every day into the office in the city. Actually, that's not the case, you know, and because we saw that as non-negotiable, um, we, and, you know, the city's kept growing, then we had to keep growing our infrastructure. We need to keep building new roads. And we're spending billions of dollars as a community to build infrastructure to support these ways of working. Um, now, I'm hopeful and really optimistic, actually, about COVID and the impact it's going to have in the long run, because I, I see that we've made a seismic shift in what we believe is normal, uh, what we believe is possible. And therefore, the pressures on that infrastructure and so many other aspects of our society will, can potentially be um, reduced uh, if, because we're actually now starting to embrace more flexibility in the way we enable work, which is pretty cool. Do you think, mm. Tim, um, with the infrastructure, we don't obviously want to have people lose jobs or you know, not develop on the infrastructure and yeah. mental health? I think what, what's more important, and it's been highlighted here, that the mental health, we don't have the enough space. Infrastructure could be routed a different way, you know, libraries yeah. or hubs in suburbs or councils where people <laughs> That's right. the same. 
uh, area of business can probably work together. You know, internet, internet's probably free everywhere you go now, you know, in shopping centers, libraries. So yeah. is this something that you think would be a workplace innovation, taking the mental health stress out, seeing people? Because mental health is about seeing people around you and in yeah. that environment. Do you think that's, that's acceptable or can be the new normal and infrastructure cost can be invested there? I hope so. I think it's a domino, isn't it? I think what I've kind of, my belief for a long time has been that, that if we can shift our ways of working as a society, that can be the first domino that falls, that then impacts infrastructure spending, that then creates other opportunities and other opportunities. And the possibility of, you know, of shifting those ways of working, the impact that that can have, the ripple effect across our community um, could, can be extraordinarily positive and, and, and enormous. Um, so your example is a great one, and I, you know, I can only imagine what else is possible. So yeah, I, I, as I said, I'm incredibly optimistic, and I, I, and I am obviously passionate about this because, because of that, because of the bigger picture. It's not just the impact on the employees, but it's the impact on their families, the impact on how we have to spend our, you know, our commons, how we impacts the commons, how it impacts society, how it impacts, you know, politics, everything. So you know, really, this institution of work has been stuck in the mud since the industrial age. We've added technology, we've made it more efficient, but we've made existing processes more efficient. We haven't actually really created new ways of doing things all that much. But in the last six months, we've just leapt forward in a way that I could have never have imagined happening. Like six months ago, if you had said to me that there would, we would have the majority of people in, this, in, in, in our industry and in most industries working flexibly and working from home, those that can, will be, I would have said no way I can't even imagine how that could even be possible and here we are it's just phenomenal it is really phenomenal so yeah I, I I'm really I mean a lot of a lot of stuff about COVID which of course we can talk about this I don't want to even talk about because uh, you know it, it's everybody else is already talking about it there's so much positive stuff that's going to that's coming out of this that um that's that's that I just you know I think long term that's going to have a bigger impact on society than the negative that we're experiencing now I think the positives will stay the negatives, they will be in history, but the positives will carry forward. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, yeah, I, I just, yeah, couldn't, can't believe it really. It's extraordinary, the shift we've made. Yeah, look, I totally agree. I, I, I can't see how um, we could go backwards. Um, and I, I think on that note, Tim, with very optimistic uh, outlook for the future. Um, we're approaching the end of uh, our uh, hour. I wanna thank uh, you, Tim and Ankit for your time today, your insight, um, you know, as well some of the you know, prep work we did before this. So thank you very much. Um, thank you to all of our members for joining us today and submitting your questions. Um, you. Really appreciated. Um, just a... a Derek, ahead. can I just say, look, you know, apologies to everyone. I know I've already apologised and I'll do it again for being a bit, being late. But in return to, you know, the, I know there's about 40 or 50 people on, on the line and, um, you know, happy to, to extend the conversation and continue the conversation one-on-one -on -one with anybody that wants to reach out. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, that offers its standing for anybody who'd like to explore this even further. Oh, that's, that's, that's brilliant, Tim. Thank you. And I'm the same, you know, if anyone wants to talk and, uh, you know, talk about how did we go through the challenges and, you know, per every organization is different, every uh, scenario is different. So more than happy to, you know, connect on LinkedIn or um, anywhere else and talk about this more in detail. All right. Uh, thank you, Ankit. Again, thank you to both of you. Um, just before we wrap up, letting everyone know uh, the second uh, event in our masterclass uh, series is on the 17th of September, where Tim again will join us, as well as Marie Morgan Monk from People Care Health Insurance. The discussion for this will be around uh, support and well being um, and uh, how to, to manage that, and some insights and some case studies and so on. Uh, if you want to join us for that event, uh, just simply go to the Oz Contact website or visit the Oz Contact LinkedIn page, and the details will be there to sign up. So. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, on behalf of Oz Contact, hope that you all remain safe and healthy. And uh, thank you again and have a great day.